first of all for inviting me to talk about this topic I find that very interesting and very complicated let's try to simplify this all right before we start talking about the russian empire we need to talk about okay wait does everyone here understand english at least on like the most basic level I think everyone can understand it. I, I don't okay. think there's, there's any problem. Okay, if something happens, Ruzgar will translate to you. I am throwing all the responsibility on Ruzgar. Thank you, Ruzgar. Right. You'll be the hero of today's um, lecture, if anything happens. Anyways, before we embark on our journey to talk about the Russian Empire, we need to talk about the Russian civilization, like how it formed, what influences it so... If we talk very basically about that, like Rurik, the first uh, kniaz of not even Novgorod yet, the first kniaz who has established at least some statehood on the territory of Ruthenia, was a Viking. Like very basically, he was a Viking. The classic one with, with an axe. Of course, they didn't have helmets with horse, but he was a Viking. He believed in Odin. He believed in Thor. We will talk about this. And this will linger for a very, very long time in the Russian history, all the way until the Mongol conquests, all the way until Russia even accepts uh, Orthodox Christianity from the Greeks. Okay, let's... I have already spoiled to you everything. Let's slow down. So the Vikings... They are like they are not fake in this aspect. They had boats, they had uh, you know raids. They were not interested as much in conquest at that time as they were interested in you know robbing caravans, uh, traveling through the rivers to attack more rich cities. For example, they have attacked even Azerbaijan when I am living right now. The like the territories of contemporary Azerbaijan, they were attacked by Russian, let's say, Varangian uh, raiders. They were pretty good at this. They even besieged Constantinople several times. Of course, they didn't, like, capture it because they saw, excuse me, they saw Theodosian walls. Ruzgar, once again, who lives in Istanbul, can tell you a lot about Theodosian walls, like those, this triple layer. It's it's impossible to conquer, but they just, okay, give us money and we will go away. The, obviously, the Byzantine emperor decided that it would be cheaper to just give them money and they went away. They started going a lot to Constantinople, in and out, in and out. And eventually it ended up in uh, like the Russian, let's say, queen mother, Olga, a very, very important, let's say, Knyaginia in the history of Russia, she accepts Orthodox Christianity on personal level. Right now on personal level for, I think it's for political reasons. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, we can, we can. Okay, like uh, they, if, if they sometimes like show uh, like uh, symptoms of life in uh, in chat it would be very great because otherwise i feel like i'm talking into silence and it's a little bit weird okay so after that after this let's say personal conversion of olga uh, we know that russia will become orthodox christian uh, in if i'm not mistaken what was the year 19 i don't remember the the year uh, 908 87. Anyways, it's not that as much important. It was Knez Vladimir who accepted Christianity because he was promised a wife. He was promised an alliance, an alliance with Byzantium. Uh, obviously, this alliance was targeted against the Turkic nomadic peoples. First of all, Pechenegs uh, against Hakazars because these guys had uh, immense power and were a threat both to Russians both to Rus at that time. The term Russian appeared a little earlier, uh, both to Slavs and Greeks. It was a great threat. <sighs> and once again, as you can see here, the relations with Turkic nomadic peoples were very complicated because we know records uh, say that, for example, some Turkic mercenaries, Pechenegs, they usually worked together with, for example, Svetoslav. For example, we know records of him uh, like 
buying their service, let's say, for money. After that, let's talk about what happened in the 13th century. We all know what happens in 13th century. Mongols appear and they conquer Russia. Mongol Tatar yoke lasts for at least 300 years. Novgorod more or less escapes this awful fate, but even in Novgorod has to pay them money for protection. It's once again like the Mongols were like gangsters. They came and say, okay, you pay us money, we protect you. If you don't pay us money, we will create you enough problems so that you will have to buy protection. After that, uh, in the latest era, obviously, we will see that in the 18th, 19th century, we will see that Russia, once again, let's start. So they, initially, Russia was a Viking state. It was created by Vikings. So we'll talk about that. People uh, believed, uh, like the elites of the society believed in Odin, all that stuff. Then they started copy-pasting Greeks. Then they started copy-pasting Turkic and Mongol peoples, like in terms of military, in terms of post delivery, even the term Yama, which is which is from Mongolia Yam. It was a post station to deliver post letters very fast, very efficient. It was copy-pasted. And after that, they start to copy-paste basically military from Germany, culture from France. Uh, later, for example, Nicholas II, he will be a very strong Anglophile. He will talk in English at home, like to everything was Anglophile to that degree. Once again, what proves what I am talking about is the journey of Ibn Fadlan, who, who found a burial site uh, that was done in the Norse religion uh, manner. It was done not in the Slavic manner because once again, what they found, they found uh, uh, some feudal lord, very powerful guy and a slave woman in a boat. They were like buried in a boat. This is not something Slavic uh, pagans do. Slavic pagans, they used to yeah, like build hills, art artificial hills and uh, cover uh, like people in those artificial hills, artificial mounds. Uh, but boats is something almost exclusively only Vikings do. This proves what I was talking about right now. What's again an interesting fact. Even Fadlan was an Islamic scholar. He was going to test the faith of Volga Bul Bulgars. They accepted Islam at that point. And they freshly accepted. They need to check how are they worshipping Allah, if they're doing it good or bad. And he found this, basically. He found evidence of uh, Viking, uh, Varangian influence in Russia. Okay, army before Peter the Great looked very much, very much like uh, an Asian countries. Like, it looks almost exclusively like a Mongolian uh, horde at this point. It does not look like a European power. While, for example, Poland already in the 17th century has a pretty westernized army. So you see that these guys uh, are stuck very much in the medieval. Of course, they have muskets, but the army structure, the army discipline, like the main army strategy is very the function of the army itself is very feudal, it's very medieval. They do not have like a proper regular army. Like, come on, this, this does not look like a 17th century, uh, appro something appropriate for the 17th century. It looks appropriate for 13th century. Of course, if we miss the muskets, muskets were obviously used. Okay, heavy, heavy reliance on boyar cavalry. At first, it's called Drujina. Every, let's say, knyaz, every more or less powerful feudal has at least uh, 50 uh, armed cavalrymen following after him. At first, it's called Drujina. Then in 13th century, approximately, we start calling it Dvor. Dvor is Russian word for the yard. 
Well, you see, once again, Viking, Turkey, and Mongolian influence, as I said, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious who were they, who they were copy pasting from. Okay, reforms of Peter the Great. Peter the Great sees that, okay, Russia is a medieval state. We need to very urgently upgrade it. So Peter the Great starts to already copy paste a lot of things from, from Netherlands, from Prussia, Germany, from, let's say, England, France. He even lives a long time in the Dutch shipyard. He, like, he's like incognito under the fake name. He is building ships in Netherlands to learn all of their secrets. Of course, he succeeded in that. And even by the by the middle by the middle of his reign, he is even able to pretty much defeat Sweden, a very serious country in that uh, period, a very serious country. He manages to have more or less successful war with the Ottomans. He managed to westernize his country and the army. He melts the, the bells of the church. You know, the churches have these bells, giant ding, 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 ding. They call people for the prayer, basically. He takes them all, melts them, and makes cannons out of them because I'm sorry. We need to win a war here. We don't have for your religious uh, rituals. He also introduces conscript system. Uh, at first, it was for life. Imagine that you have to serve in the army for life. Of course, not everyone. For example, like maybe he hired like 10 people from one millage. It's not that much. But these 10 people had to serve their entire life at first. Then it was decreased already in the 19th century. And then it was decreased again by the end of 19th century to 12. A pretty brutal time, if you ask me, but this is the reality of our time. Once again, Peter the Great. Russian Empire had one problem. Russian civilization had one problem. It was that they could not produce enough grain. The, let's say the center of Russia, like the Russian mainland, has awful climate. It has awful transportation system. It almost doesn't see, let's say, sun. It has awful soil. Nothing grows there. The one hectare of land brings very little, let's say, crops. Obviously, this was a great problem. Uh, this is why in Russia, the strong fist of the Tsar never ceded to fail never it never ceded to exist it there was always this strong hand of the tsar why because there were no developed towns everyone was forced to work in the village like in the farms because there was no surplus there was no extra grain and you know there is no if there is no extra grain that means that there are no cities there is no bourgeoisie there is no uh, resistance to the absolute absolutism absolute absolute authority of the tsar this changes in the times of uh, catherine the great she as you know annexes crimea annexes uh, a lot of territory in ukraine belarus annexes pretty much warsaw vilno as well we know the last partition of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth did not go very well for them, but went very well for Catherine the Great. This creates another problem that previously we had very little grain, but now we have too much grain and we need to import to sell this grain to someone who wants. Like we know that, uh, for example, by, if I'm not mistaken, what was the year? I'm sorry. Uh, 19. Was the year God damn it? By 1913, uh, 50 percent, almost a half, exactly a half percent of Russian income was coming from uh, sending of grain. So it's the biggest, the biggest exporter of grain at that time was Russia. 
Uh, Winston Churchill said that I will die of laughter. I thought that I would die from old age, but I will die from laughter because I learned that Russia, which has been an exporter of grain for 200 years, has started buying it in the times of Khrushchev. That's another story. Okay, here you can see the basically the timeline of Roma Romanovs. We will be mostly interested in the very last, in the last five guys, because these these guys are obviously also also interesting, but they need a separate lecture. Okay, they, as you can see, that they are not all continuing the same policy. Alexander the first was a rather liberal politician. Nikolai the first, he grew up in the conditions of a war with Napoleon. I assume everyone knows that Russia was at a very dreadful war. So he was, let's say, a man of the military. He, from the childhood, he saw war, he saw death. He was not very, let's say, happy about this. So we, he will become a very reactionary ruler. Then we will see Alexander II, who was comparably liberal. If we, of course, if we don't... Uh, remember the genocide against Muslims in Caucasus and Central Asia, which of course were very terrible. If we forget the war with the Ottoman Empire in the 77, in the 1877-78, he was a liberal because he was the one who abolished this uh, awful, this awful, um, what's called, serfdom, the krepasnoe prava in Russia, the feudalism, basically slavery. He abolished slavery, but on some conditions. If we have time, we will talk about this. Alexander III, again, a very strong reactionary. A very strong reactionary. He, because he saw that his da dad died in an assassination attempt. He thought, okay, if these guys are killing my dad, then they there also can kill me, so I better not give in. Nicholas II, he was also very let's say he was very outdated for his time he was basically i don't know what he was thinking he was thinking that he is in in the medieval age if i have time i'll talk also talk about this but we're mainly focused on war here so let's move on serve them okay uh alexander the first no even the catherine the catherine the great the great excuse me she promised to abolish serfdom then she passed it on to her son, Paul. Paul died very quickly in an assassination attempt. He was choked by a scarf in his own palace. Uh, oh, 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 unfortunate guy. He passed it to Alexander anyways. Alexander said, okay, I cannot do it. Uh, I am passing this to Nicholas II. Nicholas II, my son, he will cancel, abolish the serfdom. Serfdom is basically a slavery, by the way, when a feudal lord can buy a person like it's not a person, like it's a commodity. Uh, Nicholas I, once again, he was a reactionary. He said that, uh, I don't care. I'm sorry. Yes, I understand how awful serfdom is, but no. Alexander II was at last the person who in... 1861 abolishes uh, this uh, awful, uh, let's say, step of the past, awful pillar of the past, awful institution of the past that didn't let Russia develop properly. Because he had seen that his father lost the Crimean War against the Ottomans to an extent due to serve them due to like obsolete administrative institution he said no we are updating we are moving from feudalism to capitalism at last we need to do this oh, i wish i could talk more about this alexander the second this guy can you see my cursor guys Rutgar? hello yes yes we can yes. Yeah, you can it's great news uh this guy by the way, how am, I, how am I on time? I'm not able to keep track on time. Is everything good? We're doing good. You have around like 20 more minutes right now. 
Okay, I think that's enough. Alexander II, he passes uh, a court reform, which basically uh, creates uh, very corruption-free courts. Like they become independent, they become, let's say, more democratic. His father, Alexander III, will, of course, reverse this policy a little bit. Don't talk about this. Oh, okay, I'd like to ask you all a rhetoric question. Who do you think was the most discriminated against the community in, in Russia? Uh, surprisingly enough, it was the Jews. The Jews could live only to the left of the special line draw, drawn by Catherine the Great. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring it to the screen, but basically in the lands of Belarus, Ukraine, uh, they could not live in the capital. They could not live in St. Petersburg, like under no condition. They could not engage in any form of politics. Very often, very often, like every conflict in the city, for example, I don't know, even if, for example, a Jew by accident hit a Russian officer, this could trigger potentially. Of course, I'm exaggerating here, but I want you to understand the principle. Uh, this very often triggered Jewish pogroms. Pogroms is a basically, I don't want to say, it's basically a genocide, like basically a group of very angry people, sometimes military, sometimes uh, civilian, they go and uh, bully and kill and destroy uh, a certain people based on what like their religious basis. Discrimination in Russia did not exist on ethnic basis yet. Uh, it existed on religious basis, mainly. Mainly. So it means that Jews were hardly discriminated, highly discriminated. Muslims saw pretty moderate discrimination. I am saying moderate because, for example, Muslims could live in Petersburg, could engage in some politics, could pray in their mosques. Uh, because we know that sons of Sheikh Shamil, Sheikh Shamil is a rebel, a very, very strong rebel that uh, fought against the Russian Russians in Caucasus. They could receive more or less uh, normal education in Russia. Even Sheikh Shamil, he was, after he was defeated, he received some house in mainland Russia. I don't forget, forgot the name, unfortunately. He lived in Kiev for a short time, then he went to Mecca and Medina. So more or less, it was a little better than with the Jews, a little better. Of course, I'm not saying that discrimination did not exist against Muslims. It surely did. Uh, pogroms uh, when they were conquering Central Asia, when they were conquering Caucasus. Okay. I'm sure most of you have seen like the, the map of Russia, but it usually in, includes something like this. Usually it is it does not include a couple of very important regions. But as you have guessed, you can see here that these territories are colored almost in the same way as the actual Ru Russian borders. Why is that? Because after the second Rus Russia-Iranian war, uh, basically what happened as an aftermath of that, Russia conquers Igdir. I'm, if I'm not forgive, I'm not make, messing up. It's somewhere here. Russia conquers Kars in uh, in the 77-78 war with Ottoman Empire, and this territory, like the whole north of Iran, the whole north of Iran, is under Russian protectorate. It is heavily under Russian influence. This part is under Russian influence, and this part approximately is under the influence of these guys, UK. They have uh, split Iran in three spheres of influence. And in the middle, there was a neutral zone so that they don't like, like have border frictions. Like Tehran, Isfahan, all these 
cities, they had Russian troops stationed in them. It was basically a Russian... This land was under Russian uh, protectorate. Even the Persian Shah, he was protected by the Kuban Cossack uh, divisions. Like his bodyguards were Kuban Cossacks. Okay, Central Asia was conquered by uh, Alexander II. We know that previously there existed uh, Hiva, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Bukhara and Kokan Hanates here. They were conquered. Uh, moving on to this region. This region is also of vital interest for, for Russia because they always wanted to have, uh, they always ex wanted to express hegemony over this uh, territory of Far East. But what was, what was the problem? The first problem is that they did not have a, a proper uh, railroad here. They were building a Trans-Siberian railroad towards the city of Vladivostok. And here comes the second problem. Vladivostok is located in such a place uh, from where you cannot use the, the port uh, like the whole year because in winter water freezes there and goodbye. I am sorry you cannot transfer anything from here. Uh, so they decide to rent from China uh, Port Arthur and locate their uh, navy there. Also, they rent from China a special. That's I forget that I have the slides always. Yeah, this is what I was supposed to show you, but you can see it now. This is basically what I was talking about. Uh, Trans-Siberian railroad is in the process of being built. Uh, Vladivostok is not a very good place to have a port and Port Arthur is a lot better in this regard. So they buy from China the Chinese Eastern Railway that goes this way and when they buy it they see a very beautiful piece of land called Manjuria which was the let's say the beginning of the Qing Empire. Hello? There's no problem, can continue. Okay, Manjuria is basically a very sweet piece of land for the Russian Empire. And between themselves, they start to openly call it uh, Zelta Russia, Yellow Russia, which basically is a very direct territorial claim on already disintegrating China, already it's in this, all those stupid wars, they are all killing each other. And everyone, of course, wanted a piece of the Chinese cake. What was the problem is that Europeans at that time were very arrogant and Eurocentric, and they didn't know that, you know, Asian countries, they also exist. So, so they forgot that Korea, that was right at the bottom of uh, Russian desired land, was under Japanese sphere of influence. They forgot that. They either forgot that or they just didn't care. They will regret that. So Russian foresters, they start cutting timber at the Yellow River bank. Japan, of course, protests. They sent uh, diplomatic notes to Nicholas II already, the last Tsar of Russia, but he can accept only a limited uh, number of papers on his desk every day, so he just doesn't care. I don't care, I don't want to see it. Uh, probably it was not even delivered to him, I assume, by the looks of it. It was not even properly delivered to him. He was pretty mad about this. And no, he was pretty mad when Japan declared war on him. Yes, he was pretty mad that he was shocked. He could not believe that an Asian country could attack a more or less European one. He was in complete shock. Well, you know how this war went. I don't need to talk to you. A pretty, uh, pretty humiliating uh, Portsmouth uh, treaty with Russia. Russia loses a lot of land. Russia loses Port Arthur. Russia loses uh, Sakhalin. Russia loses Kuril Islands. 
Oh, shameful, very shameful. Anyways, this was a very, very strong hit against the Russian prestige in the war. Why did this happen? Obviously, because the Japanese have modernized very quickly. The Japanese were fighting very fiercely. And Russia had to fight a war in a very deserted place. And not even while they Remember I told you about the Trans-Siberian Railroad? They couldn't even finish it. The Japanese were smart enough to attack Russia before they finished the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Okay, we're moving on to the armaments. Uh, Ruzgar, are we good on time? Ruzgar. Yeah, we're good on time, okay. I guess. Okay. I have not found uh, appropriate image for the, the muskets and then the rifled muskets. Does anyone here know a difference in principle between a rifle and a musket? Anyone in the chat, please? Have six. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, since we have very little time, I'd like to speed it up. A musket is a straight pipe. Like, if you look inside of it, it's smooth. While a rifle has spirals inside of the of the shaft of the let's say the the part through which this bullet travels, what does what it does? It creates a spinning movement for the bullet, and it is becomes more precise. It becomes more, let's say, it becomes more precise, more deadly. Also, they invent uh, gunpowder that do not, does not create uh, a lot of smoke, which was, by the way, more powerful. So Russia, after it sees uh, French and British troops in the Crimean War, after they see it with, with rifled muskets, rifled muskets, it means that the, the bullet is inserted from the nose of the, rifle, of the musket. But it has these spiraled groovings, these spirals inside of the shaft that helped it travel faster. They were, of course, shocked that. And we are fighting here with uh, muskets. Excuse me, we need to modernize. Of course, they start modernizing. Eventually, they end up having burden rifles, which are uh, loaded not from the muzzle, not from the nose of the rifle, but from the breech from the middle it increases the amount of shots you can do per minute but even better than rifle it was not perfect because it only had one bullet magazine this changes in 1891 when russia creates the mosin rifle eugen mosin and uses the technology of emil nagan belgian arms dealer, arms engineer to create a Mosin rifle, which is still pretty relevant to this day. Okay, so infantry is uh, the main, let's say, bulk of the Russian army. Re recruit system changes for conscript system by Alexander II's reforms. Mass armies appear. So Russian army grows like, I don't know, it, they basically, they breed like uh, rabbits and becomes the most massive army, both in peacetime and in wartime of that period. Of course, this creates a problem because we cannot make enough uh, metal bullets. We cannot make enough Mosin rifles. So we start purchasing uh, Arisakas. We start, Russia starts purchasing Arisaka, Russia starts uh, purchasing weapons from the USA and Belgium, like Colts, they start purchasing Winchesters, but it does not exactly uh, fix the, the deficit of bullets, because now you had to make bullets in a war factory, and war factories were overworked by that time. Okay, the Cossacks, the absolute feast of the Tsarist Russia, very fierce war, very brutal. Uh, they engaged in almost every rebel suppression against the Tsar. Uh, 
uh, in the December, okay, not in December, revolt. They even suppressed the rebellions in Persia, in Iran, however you like to call it. They served as border guards, and in terms of war, when, when it came to war, they composed a very strong fist of the Russian light cavalry. Uh, obviously, for this military service, they were given the certain privileges. Okay, so the last remarks. Uh, beside, I, I do understand that there is a myth that the uh, Russian Empire was a completely backward uh, empire by the time of World War II, one, World War I, but it's not 100% correct because Russian destroyer, uh, Navik class, Let's, let's write it in the chat, Navik. It beat a lot of world records. It was the fastest destroyer, the fastest, let's say, mine ship, torpedo ship uh, of that time. Also, Russian bomber, Ilya Muramets. It has beaten a lot of world records for the height of the flight. It also was the first multi-engine uh, bomber in the history of, uh, let's say, in the history of aircraft. Another very interesting point that I unfortunately didn't have to mention was the works of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the man who created uh, a breakthrough in the technology of rocket science. Even I will include this in my written article. His works uh, has created already the, to the Soviet Union, which already listened a great lex lecture about. It helped him, the Soviet Union, create the notorious Katyusha reactive uh, missile systems. All right, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Do you have any? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Tsiolkovsky equations are still used today in avionics and space-related calculations. The, the man was uh, like really not from the 19th slash, slash 20th century. He was definitely ahead of his time because the, the, the people of his time, they were pretty ignorant. They, they haven't seen even a bicycle. Okay, uh, thank you, Amar, for listening. Which extent do you believe that Russian Russian culture has an influence in Azerbaijan and on the form? Oh, in terms of politics and national identity. Oh, <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, let's say Russian and Soviet uh, map drawing still creates a lot of problems in Central Asia. For example, in this drawing of the map of Uzbekistan, it's a very big. Uh, pain in the ass, excuse my language. Once again, the, the border drawings of, you know, Nagorno-Karabakh also creates a lot of problems. But I would like, but I personally think that overall the influence, of course, I am not geni denying the genocide. I never deny genocide. But overall, I think that it was a positive. By like, we got, uh, let's say, we got access to a very good quality Russian imperial education. Then we got a lot of uh, rights for women in the period of uh, USSR. So there are good positive influences too. Did I answer the question? To which extent? To a moderate extent, uh, of course, it is not as influential right now. Right now, a lot of countries, they are going away from the Russian influence uh, for objective reasons. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Umut. I also enjoyed your, your lecture on the Soviet Union. We should have, like, we should have, Rusgar, you should have, like, uh, put us uh, in different positions because I am talking about the Russian Empire and he's talking... Uh, that's a, that, that's a secret. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a secret. Mm -hmm. Yes. The the question of Russian influence is, uh, yeah, this, this deserves a separate session. Very interesting topic. Very controversial. Once again, I think it was mostly mostly good. But once again, this already depends on your political alignments and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Rusgar. Uh, thank you. My name is Rusgar. I was recording this beautiful session. Okay, if there is no any more questions, what do we do, Rusgar? I am once again putting all the I responsibility. Think, I think it will close it itself in like a minute right now. Mm, okay. Or if you want, you can because, close because it right I, now. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Hope you will write. Li hope you will read the written report too. I will. Rusgar, will you share share like the what I wrote to these guys? Because yeah, yeah, I a lot of information. Also. Yeah, I will. I will. No problem. Okay. Goodbye, guys. It was a pleasure for me.